always we'd like to thank our friends organization, our volunteer organization. Um, their, all of their efforts make things like this possible, all the special things we do in the library, and it's because of all of their volunteer efforts. We really appreciate them. So thank you to the friends for sponsoring this program. Tonight, I would like to... Yes. <laughs> Now I would like to introduce our special guest tonight in our author series. Some of you, you know, may know him from Chronicle. Um, <laughs> uh, when I told my mother that we were having Ted Reinstein from Chronicle tonight, she said, oh, is he the cute one? So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, mom, he's the cute one. <laughs> anyway, he is a reporter, an author, and here he is here tonight to discuss his newest book, New England General Stores. So please welcome Ted Reinstein. Thank you very much. And first and foremost, thank you to the friends of the Flint Library. You know, libraries today, more than ever before, cannot have enough good friends. And clearly, this library has a lot of good friends. So that says a lot to me, both about the library, the community at large. Um, and what an amazing library. And, you know, while I'm going to take questions when I'm all done, I do have a question for you right off the bat. How is it possible? that I've had three books over the last five years spoken all over the state, and I have not been here yet. <laughs> That's not right. Um, this is a gorgeous library. Um, Sharon, right, we were talking for like 15 minutes about how unique this, I've been in a lot of libraries, and I love public libraries with a passion. And this is an incredible library, so you're very lucky. Uh, anybody go to the parade today? Everybody? No? Watch no. Smart. Smart. You know, it's funny. My, uh, you know that, that, that younger kids now uh, think, like like my daughters were like texting back before they had this thing going with their friends uh, during the Super Bowl, end the drought. Because as, one, as my younger one put it to me, Dad, there hasn't been a parade now in four months. <laughs> but you know, I did, let, I did let my older daughter go skip school today and go to the parade, but before she knew I was going to let her, she did try the old, you know, yeah, tell me like you didn't go to the Patriots parades when you were a kid. <laughs> right? I said, honey, when I was your age, the Patriots were the worst team in football. And they were for 15 years before that and 15 years after that. Okay, so, yeah, boy, how things change. So, but we're not here to talk about football, although I'm happy to. But um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about my, uh, my third book, my most recent book, which is all about an iconic New England institution, which is one of really two iconic New England institutions that in all my travels around New England, over the last 25 years or so, I cannot, cannot pass by. Now, one of them is a general store, and the other one is a green screen. Uh, now, the other one is a diner. I won't hold you in suspense. But, uh, you know, we're going to actually start off, though, rather than... Um, oh, don't tell me now I'm going to have to look for a teenager in the house. Um, there we are. Are we? No. No. There we are. Now, believe it or not, though, we're going to start off with a little zoology lesson. Um, oh, wait, you thought there'd be no work tonight? <laughs> um, so you are looking at an endangered species that became completely extinct, right? You won't find a dodo bird on Dear Mother Earth anywhere today. Uh, this is an example of a presently endangered species that is not yet completely extinct. And so is this. Now, I mentioned that there were two iconic New England institutions that in all my travels around New England, I can't pass by. And I said, one is a general store, obviously, but the other is the diner. Both of them born in New England. Now, the diner offers kind of a hopeful sign if we're talking about endangered species becoming extinct and the general store being on that list of threatened species um, because the diner has made a comeback. The diner has made a comeback. I started to notice it about, I don't know, 15, 18 years ago in my travels uh, that diners were making a comeback in the sense that fewer of them were going up for sale, and those that did go up for sale were more often than not successfully being sold and kept 
as a diner. So in other words, the slide that had begun in the 1950s, when the diner was first threatened by fast food, right? Um, the slide was arrested. So sometimes when, when, the, when the slide of something begins to at least be arrested, that counts as progress, right? Until things rebound. Well, the same is true, the same is true of general stores and for the same reason, community, community. You're gonna hear me use that word a lot tonight because it has everything to do with why general stores mattered originally why they matter today for many of those towns that are lucky enough to have one more than ever before is that sense of community. It was true in the 1930s, it's true today. The big box stores, as easy as it might be to think that they threatened the general store with extinction, they didn't. Primarily for one reason, they didn't exist when the general store started to be threatened with extinction. In fact, when general stores began to be threatened with extinction, when they began to disappear, Sam Walton was still running things out of a single store in Missouri. How long ago was that? More than half a century. More than 50 years ago. Now, I always like to point to one of my favorite chroniclers of American popular culture, John Steinbeck, who was kind of like a canary in the, in the coal mine when it comes to noticing when the general store began to be threatened with extinction. It's interesting, you can point to something he wrote, and nobody had really written about it before, and when he wrote it, it really, if you look at historically afterward, it really is when they began to kind of disappear. It really is. Now you know, here he is pictured at his home in Sag Harbor, Long Island, New York, in 1960, and you know, that year, that fall, September 1960, Steinbeck set off with his best friend Charlie, and I've always wondered, you know, I wonder if Mrs. Steinbach, his second wife, um, I wonder if she sort of didn't like so much that he referred to Charlie as his best friend. It's like, what, right? Yeah. Like, what am I, chopped liver? <laughs> what, you can't call him your second best friend? I don't know. That's just what I always think. Anyway, here he is pictured in Sac Harbor. And you know, that fall, he took off with Charlie in his custom-built GMC pickup with the camper in the back that he nicknamed Rosanante. Anybody know what Rosanante refers to? Librarians are excluded because they know everything. <laughs> you know what they say, right? If you want an answer, you can Google it. If you want the right answer, ask a librarian. Because they not only give you the answer, they give it curated, in curated form. Right. Uh, anybody know Rosanante? Don Quixote. Very good. Very good. Yes, yes, a prize for the woman here in the second row. <laughs> Rosinanti was Don Quixote's horse. Right, leave it to Steinbeck to name a pickup truck with a literary reference. But they circumnavigated America in 1960, 61, 62, when he finally got back home. Look what he noticed, because he was traveling through small town America. Now, it wasn't not to say that he didn't stop in some and write about some big cities, especially if you remember Travels with Charlie, uh, most notably, New Orleans, where he wrote at length about civil rights, uh, which was kind of a nascent issue at that time. But mostly, Steinbeck gravitated to small towns. That's what he liked. So he was in a perfect position to see something that was happening in small towns. Look what he noticed more than 50 years ago. That the big towns seemed to be getting bigger, the villages smaller, and all those wonderful little distinctive stores, including general stores, that seemed to give the country much of its unique character, were beginning to disappear more than half a century ago. Now, when Steinbeck was growing up in Salinas, California in 1900, this was a scene that was instantly recognizable to virtually every American in 1900. You probably were in a place like this once or twice a week if you lived in any kind of a rural area, even more than that. And if you weren't, your parents or grandparents had nothing but something like this to shop in when they were kids. And yet, if you go 50 years out from this picture, you have a completely life-changing event in American history. You know, we don't think of it that way as much now, you know. But when I looked at this and thought about this, it's amazing what the automobile did. See, today we think of the automobile as being a game changer in terms of merely mobility and transportation. That's true. I mean, that's true. That's what it did, right? But because of that increased mobility, 
it changed everything. And it had impacts for everything, including general stores. You know, around 1956, for the first time in American history, a majority of Americans owned a car. And what that meant was, yes, it meant mobility, but because of that increased mobility, it changed everything. If you read about it, it changed the way we carried on relationships. It changed the way we worked. Where we went for work, we could choose to uproot ourselves and go somewhere else for work in a way that people just didn't do before the automobile came on the scene. And it certainly changed the way we shopped. It changed the way Americans did commerce. And if you go 50 years out from here, you have the mushrooming of the interstate highway system. And now, if you live in one of those small towns that Steinbeck was talking about, and this is the choice at your little local store where you might jump in, you know, on your way back from work and get a quart of milk or a stick of butter, and now you can jump in the car that's parked outside your house in the driveway, drive an exit or two on the interstate, and have this. A little bit tough to compete if you're offering this, right? But a funny thing happened on the way to extension. And this is really like the central irony of the book. In fact, it's what made me want to write the book. You know, I, I always like to point out first what this book is not, which might sound like a curious way to sell books. But um, I always point out it's not an exhaustive, comprehensive listing of all of New England's general stores, right? So in other words, if you wanted a book that would list every state's general stores, right, in comprehensive listing, this is not the book. So if anybody thought it was, and you want to leave now, I will not be, I will not be this. But no, I'm not a list maker, you know, and I didn't have any interest really in, in writing a list about general stores. What I, what I did want to write was this irony, this irony, right? So this book is, and there, there are general stores from each New England state, but they all in their own way tell the narrative of why general stores mattered why they were threatened, why they almost disappeared completely, and why they matter today in many towns more than ever before. Every general store in the book has been around for at least 100 years, three quarters of them for twice that long, more than 200 years. They've all been a general store for all of that time and never anything else. They've all occupied the same physical footprint for all of that time, with one exception, which will be the very last store we talk about, but most importantly, Every general store in the book that we're going to talk about is a genuine community gathering place, right? That's what we're leading up to now. Because the same forces that seem poised to exterminate the general store, right, as an iconic place in American life, end up in the end being the same forces that help save them. How's that, you wonder? So, let me explain. So by the time you get to the late 60s, early 70s, mid 70s, you have, again, solely because of the automobile and increased mobility, you have the rise of the suburbs in a way that never existed before. I mean, the suburbs have existed as a thing since the 1830s, but never in a way they existed by the time you get to the late 60s and 70s, all because of people's increased mobility. So you have, I mean, this is California, but you know this is repeated coast to coast. You have the rise of these mushrooming suburban communities in metropolitan areas, and you have now the children of the World War II generation, you know, the boomers, starting families of their own, living in homes with square footages that their parents could only have dreamed about, often in suburban communities. They have wonderful schools and great recreational amenities and athletic programs. And in the morning, you get in your car and you drive by, you know, X number of different little strip malls, and you have your choice of 147 different places to get your morning coffee, and it's utopia. Or is it? Well... It depends what you find utopian. You know, it turns out that in a lot of these big, sprawling suburban communities by the mid-70s or so, even earlier, a lot of folks who were living in these sprawling, gold-plated suburban communities with all these wonderful amenities that had never existed in the suburbs before, they were still missing something. And another big box store-sized irony, you know what it was? I bet you can guess. Are you with her? Well, you two are. <laughs> <laughs> Community. 
These community gathering places, they were missing these because they were disappearing. They were disappearing. So it turns out community is not necessarily defined by how many people share an X spot on the planet Earth. It, in other words, it's not a factor of density, apparently. It's not a factor of volume. It doesn't matter how many people. You can live close enough to your next door neighbor to smell what they're having for dinner. It doesn't necessarily mean that you feel part of a close knit community. You know, in 1973, Life magazine published a poll that a lot of people found very disturbing because it found that a clear majority of Americans, more than 62%, said that they had only infrequent contact with their next door neighbor. That's what people were feeling. That you could be gathered together closer than ever, and in an ironic twist, you actually felt further apart from people than ever <coughs> before. And you felt further and further apart from these kinds of community gathering places. So communities, these community gathering places, as the suburbs sprawled ever further, were beginning to disappear. They were beginning to disappear, and it caught the attention of a man, I'm going to tell you about now, who really has everything to do with how general stores were ultimately saved. And I think he deserves much more attention. I, I'll confess, I, I had never heard of him before I started researching the book. But he coined a term that, well, it's where we are tonight. He coined a term called the third place. Anybody ever hear that? The third place. Yeah. The third place. Um, well, it's Ray Oldenburg's term. And it's one of my favorite terms, now that I understand what it is and realize that all this time I was feeling passionately connected to these wonderful third places in American life, and I didn't even know that I was supposed to be calling it a third place until Ray Oldenburg came along. The reason why he was studying community is actually kind of a sobering reason, because he's an American sociologist, and in the early 1970s, as these community gathering places were disappearing, Right? American life was speeding up. You had many more two-parent families where both parents were working. And a lot of these communities, sense of community was disappearing. And Ray Oldenburg thought, you know what? If these trends continue, this might be something in the future that will be gone. That sense of a tight-knit community where people actually look out for each other, where people actually know your name, where people actually care for each other, maybe it'll all be gone. And he set out to research what community means in America as a means of having some sort of way of explaining to future generations what community was once like in America. And he did. He spent a decade researching. And in 1989, he published his wonderful book, The Great Good Place. And in it, he not only coined the term the third place, he explained what it was in a way that nobody had ever explained before. And when I show you what it is, you'll say, well, I know that. But nobody really did. Nobody understood it until Ray Oldenburg explained it. Because what he found was that as mobile as we think we are, right? I mean, we Ameri we love to think of ourselves as mobile. We go where we want. We do whatever we damn please. We right? Partly true. However, however, what Ray Oldenburg found was as mobile as we think we are, we still, we Americans, still spend the vast majority of our lives in one of just three places. Okay? No, granted, it, it, we, we travel, we go on a cruise, we go travel through Europe for six months. That's negligible time in the span of an entire life. In our entire lives, we spend the vast majority of our lives in one of just three places. Nobody had ever come up with this before. The first place, you can probably guess, home, family, right? Second place, you can probably also guess, work, whether we like it or not, right? The third place is what Ray Oldenburg put his finger on, and no one had done that before. The third place is not just one single place. It could be many different kinds of places, right? We're in one right now, a community gathering room, right? A third place could be a house of worship. It could be a public library. May the good Lord bless them and keep them. It could be a diner. It could be a general store. It could be a place where you get your hair done. Right? It could be uh, the neighborhood bar where you meet your friends for a drink where they really do know your name. Right? The point is, when you go to a third place, you have the expectation that you will, even if it's unconscious, that you will run into people from your community. 
And what Ray Oldenburg found that was also groundbreaking, right, was that that's not just like, hey, that'll be nice. That'll be nice if I go to the, you know, the, the, the bar in the corner and I run into Joe. It'll be nice. It's not just nice. What he found was in his research is that it's necessary. We need that. We need that. When we go to these places and we find that we interact with people from our community, it makes us feel validated in our choice to live where we're living. It makes us feel connected. It makes us feel less alone. So they're necessary. And the point is, they would disappear. They would disappear. So what happens? So when you get to the mid-70s, back to those big suburban communities, right? So a lot of people in these big suburban communities that are missing that sense of community, right? And the boomers are starting families of their own. And a lot of people felt like, you know, I'm starting my own family now. I would really like my kids to have more of a sense of community, like I did when I was a kid, right? And so a lot of them moved. They moved from the suburbs, and they moved to smaller towns all around New England where they found that sense <coughs> of community. Not that saying it was one of history's great mass migrations, but it was a lot of people. A lot of people. A lot of people. And they went to these small towns, and they found what they were looking for. In places like South Ackworth, New Hampshire, and Putney, Vermont, and Whitefield, New England, they found this sense of community. They found these wonderful third places, these wonderful community gathering places. They had never stopped being third places because they weren't threatened with developing. So they, when they got to places like Barnard, Vermont, they found that the Barnard General Store was the same wonderful, welcoming community gathering place in 1940 as it was in 1985 on Friday night hootenannies and sing-alongs, as it was in 2005 at the wonderful ice cream counter in the back of the store, as it was in 2016 when I visited and met the brand new owners, Jillian Bradley and Joe Minerva. So it had never stopped being this wonderful third place. So this is great. So you have this wave of people that have decided they want more of a sense of community, and they move to these small towns, and they find these wonderful third places. And many of them, by the way, walk the walk. They didn't just talk the talk. A lot of these folks bought these general stores. And they became the first wave of people that helped save some of these stores that might very well otherwise have been lost. So this is great. This is great. Now you go about 20 years out. Not so great. So now we're up about the late 90s. Right? And now these folks who have bought these general stores are getting up in age a little bit. They're getting to a point where they're saying, you know, I wouldn't mind slowing down a little bit. While we still can, it might be nice to travel a little bit. But we own the store. Let's sell the store. Somebody else will keep the store going and we'll slow down. Good plan. Bad economy. Nobody. By 1998, 99, 2000, he's buying a general store. And then you get a year later to the wake of 9-11 in 2001 when you have tourism is off in New England and some places almost 90% and nobody is buying general stores. And a whole wave of them close. A whole wave. And now, now it really does look like this might be the end of the line for the general store. You know? You say, what can you do? You know? I mean, they, they, they had their day, a lot of people saved them, but now they're gone, they've gone under and people aren't buying them. The economy just won't allow it. Maybe that's it. And that very well might have been it. Had it not been for one single small town in New Hampshire. Anybody ever hear or been or know of South Ackworth, New Hampshire? No. I didn't either, actually, still about 10 years ago. You know, it's one of these wonderful towns let me locate it for you. So think about going over the border into New Hampshire on kind of the, uh, the, the, the central western side, Peterborough, right? Okay, drop a pin, go about 28 miles further west, almost to the Vermont border, Keene. Drop a pin, make a triangle north, and you're in the hill country of central New Hampshire. So just, yes, just a little bit west of Manadnock, and you're in that hill country. You're in that hill country. And there's some wonderful towns there, South Ackworth, Alstead, Westmoreland, Marlow. And South Ackworth is one of those hill towns. And in South Ackworth, it took a village. 
to save the sword, and because it took a village, and because the village responded, I believe, as I'll explain now, there's probably 50% more general stores still alive today in New England because of it. So in South Ackworth, there has been a general store, as I said, like all the uh, stores in this book for at least 100 years. In South Ackworth's case, just under 200 years. It has always stood there in the center of town. But in 2001, the owners of that store had owned it for 37 years, way above average for owning a general store. And in the wake of 9-11, they wanted to sell the store, tried, couldn't do it, store closed. And in South Ackworth, the town had to deal with the fact they had now lost their one single community gathering place. You know, we get spoiled in, in, in more suburban places like North Reading, right? You get spoiled because there isn't just one community gathering place. You have churches and synagogues, you have a public library, you have loads of places where you know folks get their hair done, you have little small stores, you have a wonderful little cafe over here, right? You have Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> that was my stop before I stopped here. So, um, so in these small towns around New England, there isn't a multitude of community gathering places. In a place like South Ackworth, this is it. And when it closed, there was no other place to gather for the community. And they were distraught. And they tried, to, they tried to sell the store. Nobody was buying the store in 2001. Nobody was buying general stores. They, they pooled their money. They took out an ad in the Sunday New York Times magazine, right? Seemed like a good idea. It's worked some, several times since then. They thought that would be a good idea. They couldn't attract the buyer. Finally, they had a the community meeting. They had many, many. And uh, finally, one person stood up at this community meeting. She said, you know... We've already pooled our money to see if we could take out an ad to buy the store. What if we pooled our money and bought the store ourselves? Kind of ran it collectively? I know it sounds very socialistic. <laughs> Sometimes that works. Is it socialistic to get together and help out a family in need? I don't think so. And they didn't think so in South Ackworth. And they did. This had never been done, ever. It had never been done. Today, it has been done in some other areas. I don't know how many of you ski. You know, you may, you've probably heard of Mad River Glen. Well, Mad River Glen is the first ski area in the world that ended up being bought and owned and is operated and owned today by its shareholders, which is the community. But it had never been done, ever, with a general store. But they did it. They put their money together. They formed a board. They found someone, they hired someone out of this to, to run the store. They operated it like a, and still do now, like a food co-op, right? I mean, you put in X amount of money, X amount of hours working in the store. You get X amount of a discount on your groceries. They went to work inside the store with a little cafe. They ended up building a pizza ovens out back to bring in more revenue. They started these harvest dinners, which today draw visiting chefs from all over New England. And today, because they did that, the South Ackworth Village store is thriving like never before. I hope the lights don't go out there anytime soon. But in Shrewsbury, Vermont, a different take on a taking a village. Now, mind you, because they did this in South Ackworth, and because it worked, you understand that it, it offered a blueprint to other communities, right? Other communities. Now, in, South, in Shrewsbury, Vermont, it not only took a village to save the store, it took a village to stand up to Mother Nature. Let me explain. So when this picture was taken, Marjorie Pierce, right there, God bless her, she was, already, she was in her early 70s, okay, when this picture was taken. And at that point, her family, the Pierces, had already owned and run Pierce's Village store for over 75 years. And it is the heart and soul of Shrewsbury, Vermont, population 842. It is the heart and soul. It is, in fact, it, you are looking at downtown Shrewsbury, Vermont, at Rush Hour. <laughs> no, I'm guessing because there's two people instead of one. But, uh, but you know, when you go 20 years out from that picture, then Marjorie Pierce, if you're doing the math at home, is now in her early 90s, right? And now she can't run the store anymore. She needs somebody to help her run the store. There's nobody to really help her. If she's not there, the store doesn't run. Can't do it anymore. The poor woman's 94. Give her a break. She just wants to take a little time off. Thank you. But she can't get somebody to run the store. She can't sell the store. She can't sell the store. The store closes. And just like in South Ackworth, New Hampshire, the little town of Shrewsbury, Vermont, has lost also its one wonderful, genuine community gathering place. 
Also, people wondering, what are we going to do? They tried to sell the store. She felt terrible. Marjorie Pierce felt terrible, couldn't reopen the store. But she did call up a friend of hers who just so happens to be one of my favorite New Englanders, Paul Bruno. Now, Paul is kind of a visionary figure, um, kind of a saintly kind of guy. You know, he's one of those people you just wonder, you want to see him get riled up sometime because he's one of those people who just never raises his voice, and he's very calm, and it drives me crazy. Um, and what's hard to believe is that he got his start in politics. <laughs> yes, but nonetheless, he is a visionary figure because he started, and today is the executive director of the Preservation Trust of Vermont, and what they started doing in Vermont today, they do all over America. And it's amazing work. I guarantee, judging from, I bet the kind of people a lot of you are who appreciate this kind of thing, you have appreciated their handiwork because they are responsible for saving, I can't even tell you how much historic preservation all around America, certainly in New England. Uh, and what they do is they help cities and towns hold on to their history. They do not do it, as nice as that might be, they do not do it out of some overdeveloped sense of nostalgia or sentimentality. They do it out of a hard-nosed sense of economics. And by saving history, by the way, I mean we could be talking about, well, we could be talking about an old general store, but we could be talking about a historic Main Street, right? We could be talking about a historic theater or a mill district, right? Like in a mill complex is a perfect example. Uh, the motto that they preach is hold on to your history instead of raising it, waiting for a developer, right, an angel to somehow alight on your vacant lot, right, hold on to it because developers ultimately want to see the bones. They want to see, just like most of us when we look for a house, right, it's much harder to imagine living somewhere in thin air as it is to a home that will attract us, right? And that's the motto that the gospel that Paul Brune preaches. But that's not what Marjorie Pierce wanted to talk to Paul about. She called him up. And she said, Paul, I need to talk to you. So Paul, being the kind of guy he is, jumped in his beat-up Prius and he drove down from Burlington. Because what else would you be driving from Burlington? <laughs> he really does drive a beat-up Prius. And in case you're wondering, he wears Birkenstocks. He, he does not have a man bun. <laughs> and he got down to the store and she said, Paul, I need to reopen the store. And he said, Margie, how are you going to do that, dear? She said, I'm not going to do what you are. <laughs> he said, I don't understand. She said, I'm going to give you the stoa, ninny. <laughs> and I'm going to give you $10,000, which is pretty much all the money I have, but I don't expect to need it too much moa. <laughs> so Paul had to explain to Marjorie. I would have loved to have been there for this conversation. Um, because he had to explain to Marjorie that as wonderful as this offer might seem, that this is not what the Preservation Trust does. That in fact, under their mission, their mandate, he couldn't accept the property. He had to tell her, you know, we don't own property, Marjorie, dear. We're not property owners. We help cities and towns invest in their own properties, take ownership of their own properties. We help them raise money. We help them write grants. We help them find federal funds, state funds, get loans. But we don't own property outright, dear, not a single one. And she said, piffle. Well, according to Paul, they went back and forth for about 30 minutes like this, but about 35 minutes later, Paul was back in his beat-up Prius, making his way back up to Burlington, and you may not be surprised to find out, the Preservation Trust owned its first piece of property. <laughs> As Paul puts it, you try saying no to Marjorie Pierce when she's in a fettle. <laughs> so, about a week and a half later, Paul was back. In, in Shrewsbury, and he had asked the local historical society to meet him at the store, which they did, including my, including my friend Sally Deinzer, who runs the historical society now. And he said to them, he said, listen, I know you all love the store, and I know you know that, uh, that I and the Preservation Trust uh, hold the deed to the store. But you're not going to see me here much again, uh, because I'm not going to be running the store, uh, and neither is the PTB. And they said, well, who's going to run the store? And he said, you are. And they were all aghast. They were, Paul, 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 whoa, whoa. You know, they, they, there must be some mistake. Um, I don't know if you think we're business people, but, you know, we're farmers. We're artisans. We're craftspeople. This guy makes cheese. 
I'm not kidding. So they were like, whoa, wait a minute. We don't run stores we're from Vermont. But he had to explain to them. Okay? He said, listen, don't worry. We've done this before. It's going to be like a wonderful back-to-school experience. Right? We're going to take field trips on a bus. Okay? You're going to have homework. You're going to learn how to take inventory. You're going to learn how to order product. You're going to learn how to completely renovate a 200-year-old general store. And I think they did a pretty damn fine job, right? Yes, they did. Yeah. Now, I don't mean to suggest that all this went off without a hitch, right? Because this is a town of under 900 people that had already raised almost $70,000, okay, to preserve the store. And just before they reopened, the Historical Society went back before the town and they asked for more money. They asked for $1,500 more. And they said that if we are going to be a genuine community gathering place now into the future, and now that we could have this, uh, you know, and we are going to, the lights will be open through thick and thin, and the worst of a Vermont winter, we really feel we need an emergency generator. You know, and there was a lot of belly aching. <laughs> Marjorie Pierce never needed a <laughs> You need <laughs> But they got it. They got it. They got it, and they reopened the store. They reopened the store in 2009, and the beating heart of Shrewsbury, Vermont, was beating once again, and it was a beautiful thing. Remember I said they had to stand up to Mother Nature? Oh, did they ever. Oh. Right. Because two years later, you may remember, Hurricane Irene barreled up the East Coast, made a beeline for New England. By the time it reached New England, it had been downgraded to a tropical storm, but big deal. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're packing the 75 mile an hour winds of an official hurricane or the 65 mile an hour winds that Hyrule was packing when it reached New England, you're still going to sweep away covered bridges like so much driftwood. And it did. It's the worst natural disaster still in Vermont's history. The power went out the first afternoon that Irene hit all over Vermont. The lights went out all over Vermont, including Shrewsbury, Vermont, except in one little <laughs> This is Pierce's about 4.30, the day that Irene hit. And over at Pierce's, Sally Dinser and her crew trooped over through the howling wind and the pouring rain and the flying debris, and they fired up that emergency generator, and the lights came on. And to see her, here's Sally tell it. She said, you know what? I looked out that window when the lights came on, and I looked down the street, and she said, it looked like something out of Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> She said there were people that were just walking up, <laughs> seeping out the light. And they got there, and the lights were on, and the coffee was hot, and the Wi-Fi was working, and people were able to call their relatives and assure them everything was OK. And you may also not be surprised to find out nobody's ever bellyached about the emergency generator. <laughs> now, so now we reach a, we reach a pivot point in, in the story. So, so now in our, in our story, we are up to the mid-2000s. Okay? Now we're up to the mid-2000s. And the national economy is doing better. And now, when some of these general stores go up for sale, and they still do, to the tune of about 25 a year in New England, but now, when some of these stores went up for sale, it was possible for someone in these communities occasionally to be able to buy the store and save the store. Now, I want to share with you, what I like about it is, not only did this person save a general store, but he and his wife, I think, would win hands down the award for the least likely New England general store owner ever. Okay? Ever. Oh, yeah. Do I get an amen on that one? Yes. Yeah. Very unlikely. Very unlikely. Uh, Steve Carell, otherwise known as, if you've ever watched The Office, probably the world's worst boss. Uh, Steve Carell grew up in <coughs> Massachusetts. Uh, yep, grew up in Acton, not too, too far from here. And when he was growing up, you know, when I talked to Steve on the phone, now that I talked to him on the phone, I just call him Steve. <laughs> um, when I talked to him on the phone, uh, I asked him, I said, to him, you know, Mr. Mr. Hollywood Big Shot, right? Where does your interest in little New England general stores come from? So he said that when he was growing up in Acton, there was a wonderful little general store, long gone, but he said when he was growing up, he was fascinated by this general store. And he said he would ride over there. He said it was the first place that he was allowed to go all by himself on his little bike, right? Probably one of those little banana seats, right? And the handlebars up here, right? It was the first place, he said, that he was allowed to go by himself 
with his own little money jingling around in the, in the saddlebag and buy candy at the store. How many of you had the same experience where a little local store was the first place? I love asking that question. I love asking that question, partly for nostalgic reasons, because I don't think it's the same so much anymore, unfortunately. It was for me, too. It was for me, too. I grew up uh, a little bit south and on the harbor from here. I grew up in Winthrop, Mass., or as I like to refer to it, the, the charming little seaside town at the end of runway 27. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very noisy, very noisy child. Sharon knows, because she grew up in Everett. So you got a little bit of the downdraft from those jets, too. Yeah, it was just louder in Winthrop. Uh, but uh, oh, same thing, little local store where I was first allowed to go by myself. Same thing was true of Steve's wife, Nancy. She grew up on the South Shore in Cohasset. Same thing. She and her big sister, Tish, she told me on hot summer nights, she used to go next door to Marshfield, where the Marshfield Hills General Store, they went there and got penny candy and ice cream on summer nights. And about 15, 16 years ago, Nancy's big sister, Tish, went out to Hollywood over Christmas time to, uh, to visit her little sister and her famous brother-in-law. And while she was there, she told Nancy that the Marshfield Hills General Store was up for sale. And Nancy said, who do you think is going to buy it? And Tish said, I don't know if anybody's going to buy it, sis. And she took out a random copy of the Globe she had with her on the plane, and in it there was a story that a local developer was proposing to turn it into condos. And at that point, Steve Corral said he overheard that, went into the kitchen, long story short again, when Nancy's sister Tish returned east, she had with her a check to purchase the Marshfield Hills General Store. And uh, it really is an authentic old New England general store. They've done some things with it today that are certainly more modern, but it is an authentically historic New England general store. It still has a post office, a working post office. You know, it used to be that every single <coughs> small town that had a general store, the general store owner was, by default, the town postmaster, right? And the USPS is not so thrilled about that arrangement anymore, but it is still the case in Marshfield during the Civil War, they, they stitch Union Army uniforms on the third floor, and I think the Corrals and their design people did an amazing job of kind of maintaining the historical integrity of the store. Yeah. And Steve did make his sister-in-law, Tish, general manager of the store. She runs it today. Today, the Corrals own a house in Cohasset. They're out here every summer, and today, no summer at the store is complete without a confirmed sighting of the owner coming to check in on things at his store, right? Now, you know, when I put this talk together, we've talked so far about saving the general store. But now we're at a point in time where they are being more saved than lost, right? And I thought it's also important to sort of pay some homage, if you'll permit me a fancy French word, to some stores that have never needed saving, right? There are some stores that are so <coughs> interwoven into the fabric of their communities that they have never been up for sale. I think in many of these communities it's unthinkable that their store would ever be up for sale. And I call them in a chapter I call Tried and True. I'll share one of my favorite Tried and True stories with me, with you right now. It's in Vermont, in Warren, Vermont. So it's up in the Green Mountains. Um, again, if you know, if you ski at all, you may know Waitsfield and Warren. Mad River Glen, which we mentioned, is in Waitsfield. And then Warren, and this store is right about equidistant between them. It's been there for over 200 years. Um, it really is the heart and soul. It has gone through all the decades as the real heart and soul of Little Warren, Vermont. If you are anywhere within 20 miles of Warren, Vermont, on any given week, you probably find yourself stopping in at the store for a cup of coffee or to get something or to meet somebody. Uh, it's a wonderful place. It is kind of a quintessential general store. Now, I was last up at the Warren store just about, well, coming up in March, it'll be three years. So it was March of 2016, right? The reason I remember easily that it was March 2016 is what was happening then nationally because it was, whether you care to remember or not, a presidential election year. And uh, I stopped in and I said to my friend Jack Garvin, so Jack, what's new? What's new? And he said, oh, what's new? What's new? What's new? Let's see. Oh! He said, this is new. He said, we are having a contest right now to name the wood stove. <laughs> wow. Uh, no, actually, 
in fairness, in fairness, as you'll see, this is no ordinary wood stove. I mean, you'll find it's some sort of stove in most general stores, but at the Warren store, the wood stove is like the central, physically defining characteristic of the store. So it's immense. So it made some sense. Also, by the time you get to mid-March in Vermont, mud season, it's kind of slow. So it's not surprising they were looking for something to spice it up. So I said to Jack, I said, well, have you had any good candidates for an A? And he said, oh, how funny you should use that word. So it turns out that about a week before I've been in the store, another longtime friend of the store, and a rather famous Vermonter in his own right, had also dropped in. And I was surprised that he was even in state, because frankly, he was a little busy right then. Uh, he might have been back in Burlington doing laundry for all I knew, but he dropped into the store, asked Jack the same question, what's new? Same thing, Jack told him we're having a contest and made the stove. Obviously quicker on his feet than I am. He had an idea. He said, I have a suggestion. And they liked it, and he won. <laughs> <laughs> Bernie Sanders won the stove making contest at the Warren store. Right. And you know, I've always wondered, because you know, about four and a half, five months later, he didn't win the Democratic presidential nomination. And I've always wondered if maybe somewhere, even unconsciously, he took some small solace in that, well, unlike Hillary, I'm on the stuff many times. <laughs> Damn, it's not nothing. It's not nothing, right? Now, one of my favorite chapters I want to share is I call one of a kind because it's kind of like, these are like the combo platter of general stores, right? They're like a little bit of everything. They are tried and true. They have never been up for sale. I don't think they ever will be. They are one of a kind in the sense that there is something unique about each one of these. I'm going to share two with you real quick. That makes, well, makes them need their own chapter. While we're in Vermont, I'll, I'll tell you the first one is in Norwich, Vermont. So, locally for you, if you don't know Norwich, so upper, upper valley area. So think of New Hampshire. If you're going up, not 93, but 89, you tend over toward the Vermont border, get to say Hanover, right? Yeah. Dartmouth, yeah. upper valley. If you go just across the Connecticut River, which of course is the border between New Hampshire and Vermont, you're, all, you're still in the upper valley, but on the Vermont side, and you're in Norwich, Vermont, where you will find... Dan and Wits. Anybody ever been to Dan and Wits? Aha! You probably know where I'm going. All right, don't give it away. Okay, so Dan and Witt were not the original owners, okay? In fact, they were high school buddies who worked at the store in the 1930s. By the 1950s, they owned it. Great, right? And they did very, very well. They did so well, they put that sign in the window, uh, which you've probably seen, which you've probably seen at other, uh, oh, I love these little bookmarks for libraries. Can I take one? Oh, sorry, was I in the middle of something? Oh, there's cookies. I didn't even look at this table. I collect library bookmarks. And I put them in my books. Uh, they put this sign in the window, they were doing really well, and they wanted to expand. Right? You do well, you want to expand like any business, great. Problem was, they were very limited in how they could expand. Very, very limited. They couldn't expand on this side because of the Norwich Inn. They couldn't expand on this side because there's a street. So their only option, really, for expansion was directly behind the building, where there was about a three-quarter of an acre-sized lot. That's a lot to build on for business, right? For a store, right? So they did. And what makes Dan and Witt so unique is that it represents sort of a very odd grafting job, right? <laughs> so when you walk into Dan and Witt's, this is what you see, literally from the door where I took that picture. This is what you see. It, it you know, it immediately looks, you, you, you know where you are, right? It's a little bit of a cluttered, claustrophobic little general store, right? But if you go just to the left of where this guy and his son are standing, you go over to the butcher counter, okay, the meat counter, and then there's a door there, okay? There's no sign on the door. In fact, as far as I can recall, there's no door. But if you go through that door, you're in a very different place. You're in the back. You're in the back. In the back, if you look at the ceiling, you'll see what I'm saying. The back actually represents nothing so much as kind of a big box store grafted onto a little general store. It is a maze of aisles. I don't know how anybody finds anything. I don't know how a lot of people find their way back out. And I am big enough to admit I'm one of them. 
Okay? So the first time I was in the back was a late winter afternoon. I was out in the back with Dan Frazier, the original Dan's grandson. And he said, we're kind of busy. We're short-handed. i got to run back up front. You're welcome to walk around. I said, great. I walked around for another five, ten minutes. I was ready to walk back out. Not happening. <laughs> Every single aisle I went up was just led me back in some other direction. And I was like, this is ridiculous. You know, it's not like, it, it's not scary. It's just embarrassing. We can just start yelling, you know, all. Right? It's like that family you know, a few years ago with the corn maze in Sterling, right? That, that dialed 911 because they were stuck in the corn maze. But that's the thing, right? You know if you were just 30 feet high, you could see your car probably 30 feet away. But you're not getting out any quicker. So when I finally got out, I said to Dan, I said, Dan, I just got lost in the back. What's up with that? And he said, happens all the time. I said, what? He said, yeah, yeah. It happens all the time. I said, what? So it turns out, at Dan and Wits, they have what I can only describe as the commercial equivalent of the ski patrol. <laughs> now, if any of you ski, you may know that in a ski area, when the lifts close to the public, right, when the light is going down, so usually about 3.30, 4, 4.30, depending on the season, time of year, when the lifts close to the public, then the ski patrol goes out. And they go down every trail and every slope and they flush them out and make sure, God forbid, nobody's hurt and left behind after dark, right? At 9 o'clock every night on Main Street at Dan Wits, they send out the appointed flusher to the back and they flush it out. And I said, I said to Dan, I said, Dan, that's very interesting. I said, but you know, like, it's not like you find people back there, right? And he said, oh yeah, oh my God. <laughs> He said, really? He said, you know, he said, I would say once or twice a week. We go back there, we find like some 11-year-old kid walking around. I said, that's not so good. He said, you know what's really not so good? Just between you and me. He said, half the time we know for a fact their parents left like an hour ago. No wonder that was just between me and him. But my other family was like very different. Takes us to Maine, takes us to Maine, Windsor, Maine, where Harlan Hussey looks like Hussey, German immigrant, pronounced it Hussey, just like Dan and Witt. A lot of parallels. Also did very well. So all through the 20s, 30s, 40s, his store did very well. Little one story, little garage like general store. He also wanted to expand. By the time he got to the late 40s, the 50s, also very limited in terms of how he could expand. He couldn't expand on either side. He couldn't expand behind because it's protected wetland. His only option was to expand vertically. So he did. So he created the three-story colossus of Windsor, Maine, that today is Hussey's huge basement level, huge ground floor level, huge third level. Now you can imagine that if you went in there and you were gonna run in quick and get something small, right? You were gonna get something like a pair of boot laces or you know, a lamp wick or something, right? You might think I would need a little bit of guidance, a little direction to find my way around and find a single little object, right? You would need to tell me where to go, what's in what section. So they help you out. I'm gonna show you the guide sign that you find when you go in, and then you'll see that what makes Huzzies unique, as far as we know in the entire world, is what they sell in combination. So if you start reading the sign at the bottom, you'll mine it for maximum yucks, okay? So you walk in, it all looks good. Wood stoves, home garden, plumbing, electrical, paint, hardware, camping gear, fishing, home supplies, guns, bridal gowns, clothes, whoa, what? <laughs> bridal gowns, right. So what makes Hudson's unique in all the world, it is, as far as we know, the only general store on the planet that sells the combination of guns, gowns, and beer. <laughs> Or basically, you want to stop shopping for a shotgun wedding. <laughs> Everything you need, right there. Uh, ready to go. Uh, which actually, in all honesty, is what Harlan Hussey's granddaughter had some fun with on her wedding day. There's the lovely bride, Kristen Valentine, and she's holding her wedding bouquet, a six-pack of Schlitz, and the groom is holding a brand new 12-gauge. Okay. Now, as we finish, as we finish, I'm going to get a little bit serious for just a moment, because you're having too much fun. Um, so, you know, when you put a book talk together, I should say, my experience in putting a book talk together is that, you know, and you know you're going to be out and talking to folks, and you want some pictures, so 
you know, before the book comes out, you sit down, you know, you, you sort of select some pictures that you think help tell the story, and you select some stories that you want to talk about that kind of tell what you think will be the interesting thing. And what I have found is that it has been a tremendously humbling experience. Because with each book, including this most recent one, what I have found is that I have no idea when it comes to what's interesting. Because what I thought would be really interesting seems to be causing people to doze. And what I never even thought about, people are suggesting, I'm like, that's a, why didn't I think of that? Such is the case with this one. So I've been humbled again, but that's okay. You know, every time, as I will tonight, um, I give a talk, and it's really my favorite part in some ways, because then I don't have to talk, is I take questions, right? I ask if you have any questions, and I love that. Um, and every single time, every single time, from the time the book came out, when I would throw the open to questions, almost invariably, one of the first two, first, second, third question was the same every night. Somebody would ask me, what's my favorite general store? You know, what's your favorite general store? Do you have a favorite general store? And I have to admit, I had never thought about that. I have visited well over 100 general stores. I have, uh, for, just for this book, visited over 60. There are four, more than 42 in the book. And I never thought about, like, was one my favorite. I think about something unique in each case about them. And so I, I had to answer that, right? Which is fine. Reason, good question. And that didn't surprise me. What surprised me was that over time, months, as, as months go along, I was driving home one night, and I thought to myself, whoa, every single time I'm asked that question, including th that night, my answer is always the same. It was the same answer from the first talk I gave through that point in time. Um, so I had to think about that. I had to think about that, and when I thought about it, I thought, of course I should share this. Because this general store really sums up everything we've talked about tonight. Remember we started talking about how important community was, right? So there's no community, in my mind, there's no community in this country that has been more loyal to its general store, that has loved its general store more, that has suffered more for its general store, that has been more heartbroken by its general store, and refused to let go of its general store, even when it was dead and gone. They still refused to let go. I thought, well, that really sums up what it means to love a general store, what it means for a community to be behind its general store. You know, like all the, uh, the, the stores in this book, there has been a general store in Putney, Vermont, for over 200 years. 1796, A.M. Corsa, one of just 13 general store owners in all that time. So if you think about it then, the owners also felt incredibly connected and loyal to the community because it didn't change hands very often. 13 owners in over 200 years. It doesn't even seem mathematically possible, right? But it is, and it's always occupied the exact same spot, right in the middle of Putney, right above little Sackett's Brook, right there, except when it wasn't there. Remember I said at the beginning there was one store that didn't always occupy the same spot? And this is it. Now, there's no great mystery to it, unfortunately. The first time, look how much it's looked like the same store. The first time that it almost didn't occupy that spot was a terrible night in May 2008, when a fire broke out on the third floor of the Putney store. Um, faulty wiring in the attic caused the fire to break, about, break out about 1 o'clock. Thank God for volunteer fire departments. Because unlike here, you know, you've got volunteer fire departments, the fire gets put out only as quick as the fire department can muster and actually get to the apparatus and then get to the fire. They're not sitting at the station. So they got there, they mustered very quickly. They, I know it looks bad, but they were able to save almost two-thirds of the building, right? Now the problems came up because the owners of the store had no insurance. They had no insurance and they decided to write it off as a complete loss and leave town. Leaving the little town of Putney to wonder what the hell they're going to do now with their beloved general store that they don't own 
and they don't know how they're possibly going to do anything with it. So Lisa Papazian, it's amazing sometimes how really wonderfully skilled at dealing with issues people who belong to the historical society are. I've often, I've often found that. Lisa got on the phone, and she made her first call to our friend, remember Paul Brun? Right. Paul Brun jumped in his beat up Prius. I think they should, they should call that the Brun Mobile. And they should have, like, remember the Batman had the back searchlight, and it should be like a little historic property in the searchlight. And he drove down to Putney, and he said, well, first thing we gotta do, we have to get the town in control of the store. Meaning, we have to make it so that you folks own the store, that Putney owns the store. Because he has, he said, I have found in my vast experience that when a town owns a property and something happens, a town can't skip town. <laughs> He's got a point. So he did. He helped them craft a way for the local historical society, meaning the town of Putney, to take ownership of the store. He shepherded them through the entire process of finding loans and getting some state money and some federal funding that they got with Pat Leahy and the governor at the time and Bernie Sanders. And they were able to raise almost $75,000. This is a town of under 900 people at that time, a little more now. And they were able to reopen and rebuild the Putney store. They were able to get it looking brand new. And they, it was really, it was a wonderful moment in Putney. You know, when the roof went on, on the, Putney, the, the rebuilt Putney store, there's wonderful stories that people I talked to and told about. They said, they said like, you just all of a sudden you heard all this honking because cars, wherever they were in and around the center of town, just stopped, got out of their cars, and started honking their horns and cheering when the roof went on. That's how much people were just so delighted to see this store become whole again. And the store did reopen, and all was good in Putney, Vermont, but it didn't last long. Oh. And that looks hard to believe. It was hard to believe. It's still hard to believe. And as bad as this picture looks, and it was horrifying, it's worse than it looks. So on the night of November 1st, 2009, less than a year and a half after the store had reopened, fire broke out again. It went to 21 alarms. They drew apparatus from as far away as Worcester, but it could have gone to 100 and 21 alarms, it would not have saved the building. It was burned down to its foundation stones in less than an hour. Fire like that, that burns down a building like that in less than an hour has to have some help, and it did. The investigators found traces of massive accelerant throughout the building, arson, arson. So now the little tightly knit town of Putney, Vermont had to deal with the double gut punch that not only had they just lost the heart and soul of their little town for the second time in less than two years, but the person who did this horrible thing might be your neighbor. Who the hell knows? That's the terror of arson. And it felt to people in Putney like a death in the family. I can't tell you how many people I talked to who expressed it just that way. They said, you know, it felt like a death in the family. They said, you know, we would have felt for anybody. It would have felt terrible if anybody we knew had lost their house or had lost the business. But this was, in a way, everybody's house. And it was gone again for the second time in a year and a half. And we were absolutely disconsolate, heartbroken, didn't know what to do. So Lisa Papazian called our friend Paul Brun again. And Paul drove down through the night. He said he arrived in Putney about 6 in the morning. Slept in his car for about an hour, and then he met the historical society at the Little Stone Church right across the street from where the store had stood. And they sat for a little while. He just listened. There was a lot of, there were tears. There was a lot of anguish. There was a lot of frustration. He was very sobering this time. He had to tell them that he had been on the phone already with Bernie Sanders and with Pat Leahy, and they had told him that the store, the, the, the rebuilding was already in the pipeline from the first time, the loans were federal loans that were dependent on the collateral of the store. And now it was frozen. Uh, so they were doubly frustrated. And after about an hour, about 50, 70 people showed up and grew to about 100 people because word got out. They were talking about the store. And now they had to move outside the little church. There was no room. And they were all meeting now outside in the cold open air. 
And uh, finally, after about an hour or so, an older gentleman, his family goes back five generations in Putney, stood up on the little low stone wall right by the curb. And he said, I just have one thing to say to you. He said, I don't know about the rest of you, but I will be goddamned if an arsonist is going to defy my town. And he sat down, and Paul Broon kind of let his, his words hang in the cold early November air. And he stood up and he said, well, if I understand my friend here correctly, we need to rebuild. And everybody cheered, and they did. And the one single silver lining in this whole thing is that this was such a tragedy, <coughs> such a heartbreak, that money poured into Putney. It made front page news. It led evening news broadcasts. You may not remember. It led some evening TV broadcasts nationally in America. And there were pictures of the Putney fire on the front pages of foreign newspapers. <coughs> That's how much of a heartbreak it struck people that this little town had lost its beloved little general store for the second time in a year and a half, and money poured into Putney. More money than they knew what to do with. They had more money than they needed to rebuild the store. They were able to establish an endowment. They got donated labor to cut the timber and soil the timber, and they were able to reopen the store bigger and better and more secure. They still needed somebody to run the store, right? They own it, needed somebody to run it. Providence Shine, they found the perfect person to run the store. There was an older gentleman in town who had been an immigrant to Putney, he and his family. And he felt, he was a pharmacist, and he felt that when his family <coughs> first arrived in Putney, and they barely spoke any English, he felt that the town of Putney had made them feel welcome. And he said the store made us feel there was a place we could go where nobody cared that we didn't speak good English, and people respected us and treated us with dignity, and I want to give something back. He said, if I can use the deserted second floor and run a little bit of my pharmacy up there, I'm not going to take a dime from the store. And they said, oh, that's a great idea. So they did. And he went to work on the second floor. They reopened the store, and the store was open again, and all was good once again in Putney, Vermont until New Year's Day 2017. I wonder, this is the story, I did, right? I said, nobody has suffered more for the general store. I did warn you. This is the under, this is the Rocky of general stores, right? Rocky doesn't get hit by Apollo Creed and bounce right back up and knock him out. It looks like he's gonna die in the ring, right? So, right? so same is true of the Putney store. On November 1st, uh, January 1st, 2017, this lovely gentleman who was running the store died. Oh, oh, oh. And neither of his, his two adult children who had moved on uh, elsewhere wanted to come back to Putney and run a store. And so the store closed again. But this time, Paul Broon got the jump on Putney. He heard it close, and he <laughs> called up Lisa Papage, and he said, Lisa, I'm sorry for your loss. You've got to reopen the store. She said, Paul, we don't have a lot of people. She said, how many people do you have now in the historical society? She said, just over 41. He said, good, everybody go to work one hour a week and get it open until you get someone to run it full time because I'm going to tell you something as true as I stand here. He told her, the longer you stay closed, the longer you will stay closed. You can multiply every day by five in terms of how long you'll be closed. And they reopened the store. It reopened last May. It is running now once again. It is truly about perseverance, as Paul puts it so well, in Putney. And as we finish, I do want to inject a little note of uh, you know, reality here, because we've talked tonight about saving all these wonderful general stores. They still close. As I said earlier, more than 25 a year close in New England, every year. So they're still closing. One of the most significant store closings of general stores took place in 2012. Right, seven years ago, in Little Compton, little village of Adamsville, Rhode Island, where Gray's closed. And at that time, Gray's was the longest continuously operating general store in American history. 212 years. Yep, just about uh, less than 30 years longer than the, shorter than the country had been in business. So that's a long time. And in a poignant note, really, in some ways, that the Monterey General Store in Berkshire. This is a photograph from a page from my book. Because when the book went to the publisher, the Monterey General Store was alive and well. Today, it's gone. So they still close, and more will continue to close were it not for the new breed, which I will end with in one moment. Because the new breed, 
I can't say enough about this new breed of general store owners. Mostly what's so surprising about them, because not only do they feel a devotion to continuing the third place in American life as symbolized by general stores, but they are by and large very young, very young, surprise, millennials. I mean, like in and around 30 years old. And not, no knock on millennials, but I, I just thought, figured that, you know, people at that age, who are the first generation to really come fully of age in the internet age and cell phones, might not have the same kind of attachment to brick and mortar stores, right, as maybe their parents or their grandparents. But they do. Many of these people do. They really do, and they're <coughs> exemplified by people in Win Whitefield, Maine, like Ben and Tara and Marcus, who, for my money, are like the poster children of the new breed of general store owners. You are looking at two people who never, ever wanted to run a general store. Never even thought about that. They're farmers. What farmer thinks about running a store? Right? They're farmers. They met at an agriculture school in Washington State. Ben's family was from Whitefield. They had hoped to move back after they graduated and, 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 and buy a few acres of land to farm. Right? But farmland in that area of Maine, South Central Maine, very expensive. And they weren't having any luck. And finally, this guy came up to him one day in Whitefield. He said, I know you guys are looking to buy some farmland. He said, I'm going to make you a crazy offer. You're going to think I'm crazy, but I'm not. He said, I will give you, give you, Five acres of prime farmland. And he said, what's the catch? He said, ah, the catch. You know, that'd be a catch. The catch, he said, is on that land, there is a long-closed, defunct general store, Sheepskit General. He said, you know, I always thought I would reopen the store, but I don't think that's going to happen. But he said, if you will run the store, keep it open for two years, the land is yours. And they still deliberated. Not so much they didn't want to run a store, right? So they only bought stuff at the store that they liked. That was what they decided to do. No, because they were hedging their bets. They were hedging their bets, especially food. They said, we'll only buy food for the store that like, we like to eat. No, because their thinking was, when this whole crazy thing goes south, as surely it will, we can at least personally liquidate the inventory. Right? We don't have to go food shopping for a year and a half. Right? But that didn't happen. That didn't happen. Oh, the land produced all right. Incredible organic produce. Carrots, the length of your forearm. People started lining up at 6 in the morning to buy their produce. And then after about 6, 8 months of this, Ben and Tara looked at each other and they said, You know what? People really like the produce. Wouldn't it be great if instead of one of us driving 100 miles or more every week to hit every farmer's market in southern New England, which is what you have to do these days as a farmer, wouldn't it be great if we could like find somebody to like open up like a little cafe in the store and use our produce? And then we could, we could bring more people in that way. And they did. They found a wonderful woman to open up a cafe. Now people were lining up and, and driving up at 6 o'clock in the morning, six days a week, to eat at their store and buy things at their store. And then they started opening up all kinds of things at the store <laughs> that general stores had never seen under a roof before. And in this regard, I always like to say that general stores are a little bit like public libraries today, the good ones. Because you know, Public libraries have lived with a little inconvenient truth today, right? They cannot, they are not, cannot be all about books anymore. Mm -hmm. Am I right, Sharon? Right? You have to be about more today. Because people have many different ways to get a book. They don't have to schlep to the public library. It's great if they do, but they don't have to, right? So you need other things today. You need to offer all kinds of interesting services and programs like this one, right? That's what they, the new breed of general store owners, have realized. You offer things like open mic night, like have wine tastings. They offer yoga classes. They have daycare. They opened up the first small lending library within 50 miles in Whitefield, Maine. And by doing that, they have ensured that the store today has become a community gathering place once again. And it is popular now with families and with older folks. And it gives hope. And what would give more hope about the future of general store owners than the opening of Hope Store, Hope General Store in 2016, that because of this new breed of general store owners, I do have kind of guarded optimism today that the future for New England's general stores and that vital third place will live on. Thank you very much. take a question or two, if anybody has a question. Yes, you get to go first because you knew about uh, the, the, the Dog to Go. Yeah. 
I just can't wonder when Putney burned down the second time, didn't they have insurance? They did have some insurance. But not uh, <laughs> now, I mean, what, what, what they needed to do in rebuilding it uh, partly was to make it more secure than it had been. But the other problem was they had insurance. That would not have been entirely enough. Part of that was also bound up with the federal and state funding, which had been frozen. So, right, you cannot, right, right. So it was dependent on uh, collateral. Um, and uh, the worst part of the Putney story, though, in terms of the aftermath, is that they never caught the person. Now, I knew that was your next question. No, it was never solved. However, however, uh, no, no, it never, however, the, the one encouraging thing is, though, that fire folks have told me that arson often strikes more than once in a, in a short period of time. And that because it has been so long, knock on wood, um, it's unlikely that that person is still there. Besides, the store is today, they joke, in, but you know, some of the local banks joke that, that it's more secure than some of the banks, you know. <laughs> Someone will open up an account and say, well, you could, you could deposit your money here at the Putney store. It's probably more secure. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's the only, one of the only good things. Yes, ma'am? Have you been to our general store, Briars? Briars? Briars. Mm -hmm. No, I saw it. I, I need to go. It started out as a very small building. For many years, run by... It was called Maury's? Maury's. Maury's. Okay. 1912. 1912. Right. Really? Yes. And when Mr. Ryer, the older Mr. Ryer, was too old to run it, he sold it to a local resident. And has it closed at any time in all that time? No. No kidding. That's wonderful. I knew I like this town. <laughs> Thanks for having me here before now. <laughs> I could have been at Briars by now. <laughs> Good thing you corrected me. Uh, now, do they have food there? Yes. Yeah. They do. Yeah. So that's what general stores have to have. Right. They have a deli and prepared You have to do that today. And really what you find is that by and large general stores have traded off hardware for food today. Nobody's going to a general store to buy hardware. Okay? And so you can't, those margins are ridiculous now. Okay? And you know, somebody last bought an anvil at a general store in 1893. So it's like, but you have to have food. You have, and good food. Good food today. So, yeah. Excellent. I will check that out. I assume it's closed when I leave now. Sure. Yeah. Do you have part ownership of it? <laughs> <laughs> you are a walking advertisement. I tell you, good for you. You're so lucky to have that. Every town does not have a place like that. They don't. That's great. I will make sure I visit that I, because that will happen when I come back and revisit the library, right? Because we'll have that in mind. Anybody else? Anybody else? Any other questions? Yes, sir. Just a follow-on to the Ryan store. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman that uh, acquired the property. I'm going to be an expert on that. <laughs> yes. The gentleman that acquired the property is a developer, a builder. And yeah. he took the old store and he moved it to a corner of the Y and built a new really? store here. So what's there now is not the original store. It's not the Correct. original, but the original store is still on the lot. Really? Yeah. Is it still is it still open? No, no, no. It's empty. He's renovating. Not, not, it, he's renovating. Yeah. Right. Well, he's a good developer. <laughs> right. He's a, he's a local, loves, lo loves the local history. If you go in there, you'll see signs from like our old lumber yard, our sawmill. I will have all, to check it out. Yeah. Well, have to so let me ask you ceilings. this. Is there a non-Ryers question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Did you, uh, did you write a book on dimes and come back and say <laughs> Would I write a book on diners? You know, the funny thing is, I would love to write a book on diners, but uh, there are whole libraries full of books on diners. I'm not sure what I could add to it. However, like I always I would love to do the research uh, on, 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 on diners. I actually visited 
what is now one of my favorite diners. Anybody ever been in the little town of Chester, Vermont, the country girl? Anybody ever been there? Oh, you have? Isn't it wonderful? It's awesome. Oh, it's now one of my favorite diners. And last week, I was in Bennington, Vermont, and believe it or not, I'm almost ashamed to say this, I had never been to the Blue Bank. How many of you have been? I'm sure some of you have been to the Blue Bank. No? Yes, yes. Uh, it's a wonderful day. You have. Yes, yes. The Blue Bend does a deep fried donut, which, if you want to ditch your diet for 30 minutes, um, <laughs> amazing. Anybody else? Anybody else? So listen. Yes? I, I just had one question. The yeah. first story that you talked about, you said you, you began to talk about the, uh, the third place. Yeah. And said that this was the only, like, gathering place in the town. South Ackworth? Yes. yes. The one that took a village to save? Yeah. yeah. And you, but then you said, and they had a public meeting. Yeah. That's what they were going to do. Yeah. Where did they hold it? <laughs> <laughs> At the store. Oh, my God. I just to make sure. Right. I should say that, though. That's a great trick question. That's a great trick question. That's the question I should ask people when I open up the floor. So if no one else has a question, that's a good one. Nobody's ever asked me that question. You were trying to trip me up. It almost worked for a minute. I was thinking, when did they meet? So um, if no one else has a question, uh, first of all, thank you again. Thank you to the Flint Library. Thank you to the friends of the Flint Library for having me here tonight. Uh, this has been fantastic. I mean, I, this is what a wonderful crowd. So thank you for coming out tonight. Um, also, um, you may not be surprised to find out that I have some books with me. So if you'll permit me just 20 seconds of shameless commerce, I do have all three of my books here tonight. So I have my first book, uh, my only hardcover, which is New England Notebook, which is a collection of my favorite stories and people and places from all over New England. Uh, I have that, and I have my second book, which is all about New England's most famous feuds, Wicked Pissed. <laughs> and of course, I have General Stores. So if you would like to purchase a book, I will set up shop over here, come by. I would be happy to sign a book for you at no extra charge. Uh, whether you buy a book or not, whether you buy a book or not, I also have at this end of the table right here a sign-up sheet for my newsletter. So if you'd like to give me your email address, I promise you, you will not get any unwanted spam. Uh, I will put you on my newsletter list. And what I like to do, especially when I'm in the process, like now, of working on a new book project, kind of get people, uh, I, I send out maybe a sample chapter, or I share what's going on with the process uh, before the book comes out. So if you want to give me your email address, there's a 50-50 shot. You'll never hear from me again. Uh, I shouldn't say that, but I'm trying to do better. So again, thank you very much. I'll be right here. Thank you. Thank you.